With those words, uh, I will just make a, a very quick presentation, uh, Dairy in Southeast Asia, and I have called it a rapid overview of key trends and some issues. I think this picture is very familiar to everybody, milk production. If you look at Asia region, milk production is being driven primarily by the region. And when I say Asia region, of course, it includes East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And uh, over the last 30 years, actually, the share in global production has more than doubled. In 1981, the region was contributing only about 15% of the global milk production. We are now almost 37%. So if you look at the growth, the growth is primarily coming from this region. Other regions may have maintained their absolute level, but this is where the growth is coming from. Within Asia also, there is a changing landscape uh, in terms of production. Uh, South Asia traditionally always was the large uh, milk producing uh, region. Uh, you know, traditional milk consumption habits uh, in South Asia uh, India, Pakistan, to some extent uh, Bangladesh. Partly perhaps it is driven by the vegetarianism where milk comes in as a source of animal protein. Uh, and also there is, uh, you know, there's been a long tradition at least in that region. And that region continues to be uh, the largest contributor as far as milk production is concerned. But if you look at East Asia, and this is a new phenomenon, uh, in the last 10 years or uh, 20 years, sudden rise of China uh, in milk consumption is, uh, you know, is one of the phenomenon. Southeast Asia, of course, by its very uh, size, because it's a small region, it will never make a big contribution, but even the contribution of Southeast Asia has been growing. So there is uh, a little bit of a changing landscape. And this uh, picture tries to show, if you look at the production rate, growth rates, uh, you know, the, the biggest gra uh, graphs biggest bars are actually coming from East Asia and Southeast Asia. So this is also, uh, this is a region that's growing. Of course, one could argue that, you know, it's easier to grow from a, uh, from a smaller base because uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia start with a smaller base. But if we, even if that was the case, if you look at 91, 2001 and 2001, 2011, actually there is acceleration of uh, growth rates. So it's not simply a, a small base phenomenon. There is more than uh, just a simple uh, small base phenomenon. And uh, that's, that's important to consider. This is a picture that tries to show the, uh, the consumption shares uh, at a global level. And you would see that uh, Asia consumption levels are increasing. Uh, not surprising, uh, production and consumption both are increasing. Uh, and within Asia, actually, the consumption shares of South Asia now have declined. Not because the absolute levels have declined, but because East Asia has suddenly become a big consumer uh, of dairy products. And some of it is self-produced. The production rates, uh, growth rates are uh, quite high. But also, East Asia is emerging as a very large importer. Uh, so consumption uh, levels have risen uh, very rapidly in East Asia. This is a, uh, just to show you the per capita milk consumption. Uh, per ca uh, on per capita basis, of course, still I think Europe and South Asia uh, are, are uh, ahead uh, in terms of, or even US. Uh, Southeast Asia still has a very low per capita consumption. Now one could argue that perhaps, you know, this milk is not very important in this region. Milk is not uh, important in the diets. Or one could see it as a, as, a, as a sign of potential, that now that there is, that it is becoming an important element into the diet, and given that uh, the milk, uh, per capita milk consumptions are still very low, uh, look at the potential that we have in this region. So it's a, we can interpret it whichever way we like. I like to see it as, as, a, as a sign of potential as well. Net imports, I think these two points were uh, highlighted uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the opening addresses. Uh, the region is uh, importing heavily and imports uh, are growing. These are uh, net imports in milk equivalents. Uh, if you would see uh, the two regions which are the largest importers are East Asia and Southeast Asia. And the uh, regions that export are basically Europe and Oceania, Australia and, and New Zealand. New Zealand, of course, is the largest uh, exporter. Now I want to go a little bit at a country level uh, not just at the regional level, and look at the diversity that there is even in, in this small 
region uh, Southeast Asia. We have uh, Myanmar, which is most of it just domestically produced. And we have Indonesia and Thailand, uh, where half, I mean, Indonesia actually pr probably more than half is imported. Uh, Thailand has done steady progress uh, over the last 20 to 30 years in replacing imports with domestic production. And so now we are at a point where it's almost half and half between imports and domestic production. And then we have Philippines, uh, which is primarily uh, imported, uh, imported milk uh, consumption. And this is how the per capita consumption is actually evolving over time. And this is interesting. Uh, and I am not entirely sure, and I think I, we would, it would be good to have some discussion on this, uh, whether we have got the data right. Um, because there could be data issues. This is the data that we have at FAO. And what we are seeing, uh, you see the, you know, Myanmar and Philippines trading places, uh, the consumption, per capita consumption in Myanmar growing quite rapidly. And if that's any indication, I think there's a lot of investment is going to go into Myanmar. <laughs> <laughs> Thailand has done consistent progress over time in production, but for some reason we see this uh, declining per capita consumption, or at least not increasing. I mean, you know, I know there's a lot of Thai, uh, Dr. Sunirat is already saying that's not true. Um, but I think before we say it's not true, uh, let's just sort of look at it, because these are the data that have been reported by the countries. Um, and if you see that between 2005 and 2009, the dairy prices, the international dairy prices surged. 2007 is when dairy prices went quite dramatically up. And that must have, surely would have Im Im impacted imports. But I'm just putting this data out just to stimulate, maybe be a little provocative about things so that we can have a, a discussion. But this is the data that's there in the international databases that, we, that people normally access. This, again, are changing import shares. Uh, there is a decline in the import shares. Thailand, of course, I'm, I'm more familiar with the Thai dairy uh, history. And we see that consistently there has been investment in production, in formation of cooperatives, in, in uh, promoting uh, consumption, uh, publicly uh, supported consumption levels and so on. And that has been instrumental in um, constant decline in the import shares. Vietnam, of course, also has now uh, lately uh, stepped up investment into the dairy sector. Malaysia. Same story, uh, in the, but some of it, I believe, is also a high dairy prices phenomenon uh, in the international market. In 2007, 2008, dairy prices were very high and surely will impact uh, uh, imp import uh, levels into the countries. These are shares, so in that sense, you know, if, if you import less, even if you consume less, your share goes down. This is... Uh, the, the International Dairy Price Index uh, that I was referring to. And you see that there, were, there have been spikes in international dairy prices. And I believe there is another spike in the making now that New Zealand um, sort of experiences a drought. China is experiencing a cold. China wants more milk. New Zealand doesn't have enough milk to give. It is going to show in the prices. Increasing prices is one of the things. Rising volatility of the prices is, is another. And I think international markets, perhaps, even if the prices don't increase as much, international prices are going to become, international markets are going to become more volatile. And as we look for more land, as we look for more water, as we look for more food to, to produce uh, for 9, million, 9 billion people in 2050, this is all going to reflect in, in the prices. I also want to just give a, uh, take a little bit of a time to sort of illustrate the diversity of production structures. And here we see that um, Indonesia still has, for example, a very small scale, small holder kind of dairying system, perhaps uh, a more on the traditional lines. Uh, Thailand has scaled up a little bit. I think the average farm size has gone up to about 20 cows. Uh, Malaysia is high, but I believe, I think, I think there are few farms in Malaysia which are very big. And if you take them out, then the, the rest of the farms are actually not so big. So this average, in that sense, gets a little distorted by those very big farms. Uh, and I didn't really have exact data to be able to take those farms out. 
but I suspect some of the farms are quite big there. In, in. But what the point they hear is that there is scaling up that is happening. And it is going to happen as we look for higher quality milk, that we need to inject better technology. Uh, there's some, of, uh, some scaling up is going to happen because uh, you, know, you have economies of scale uh, up to a certain point, even in production. Here is uh, another uh, picture to just show you uh, the price relative to the international prices. And uh, this is sort of, a, we just took the five year average over the last five years, what the average price, international price has been. And then look at the domestic price and see on average, how much was the Thai price relative to international price? How much was the Filipino price relative to the, uh, and this is the farm gate uh, price. And you see, most of the time, uh, the region, the, the, price, the farm gate price in the region is higher than the international milk price. Now that has implications about how we are going to uh, develop the sector. A lot of it is, of course, 70% of the, the price or the cost of production will be feed. And it is the feed prices that's going to drive the milk prices. And if you look at milk to feed price ratio on the right hand side, again, in um, in a number of countries, uh, Philippines has perhaps the most adverse uh, milk to feed price ratio. Uh, Thailand is around 1.5. We normally say uh, the thumb rule, of course it will depend upon how much purchased feed, feed the farmers are using in milk production. But the thumb rule will be anywhere around 1.5 gives you a favorable uh, indicator for, uh, for profitability of, in the, uh, of uh, dairy. So Thailand, Malaysia uh, stand around there. Indonesia, Vietnam a little below. So there's a lot of work to be done on, especially on the feeding practices uh, to reduce cost of production so that you have, uh, you, you sort of improve your profitability. Uh, Philippines has still, uh, there's a lot of work uh, to be done uh, on that front as well. Structure of market price. And we have divided up into three uh, farm farm gate price, processing, and then the value added taxes. And I put also, just uh, for comparison, I put India, China, and New Zealand uh, in, into this, because these are the three major players. Uh, India, of course, is not a player in terms of trade, but it is certainly a big player in terms of production and consumption. China is a big, big player as an exporter, and New Z oh, sorry, as an importer, and New Zealand is a big player as an exporter. And you would see that, you know, in terms of market price structure, um, Thailand, Vietnam, China, uh, New Zealand, they sort of come close to each other. Uh, Indonesia, because I think, again, there is not that much processing that is happening. Once you get into a little bit more intensive dairy production and have more formal value chains going, and there's a, an element of uh, processing that comes in, your uh, milk price uh, goes up at least at the retail level, not necessarily at the farm gate level. The consumption, of course, is a function of what price are we going to sell in the market, and production is a function of what price the the, the farmer is going to get. And there's uh, there can be a big gap there. Okay, now this is the background, but now comes the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015. What are the pillars of this ASEAN Economic Community? Well, these are the four pillars, and I think uh, Suryan will, of course, um, Dr. Suryan will uh, give much more details. I, I, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, single market and production base. So basically, you can invest anywhere uh, in principle and sell anywhere. A competitive economic region, equitable economic development. From the perspective of a public agency, to us, this is a very important pillar. Equity is, is, is an, an essential element of efficiency. How is it that this ASEAN economic community contribute towards equity and integration into the global economy? These are some of the free trade agreements that have been signed between ASEAN and other countries. There's China, Korea, Japan, India, and Australia, New Zealand. And I think with respect to dairy, perhaps the last one has maximum relevance. These are some questions. We saw that the production is growing, but per capita consumption is not. Is that a, is that a matter of concern? Do we need to, is there a need to stimulate consumption? Why and how? 
Now we have ASEAN Economic Community, but we also have several free trade agreements with countries outside of ASEAN Economic Community. What does this imply for self-sufficiency uh, and so on? Some countries are still maintaining uh, trade barriers to protect their uh, domestic industries. Should we continue to do that? There perhaps are very good reasons why that is necessary, but how long can one, uh, one do that? As we saw, smallholder production still predominates in many countries. In some countries, uh, there is scaling up, but there is, in other countries, um, we still have a largely smallholder production system. What do we think about it? Um, is it you know, what's our position on smallholder production? I already said that can AEC contribute to equitable socioeconomic development? What are the potential mechanisms? Do we already have those mechanisms in place? If not, what are the potential mechanisms towards realizing that goal? Because we know that it is recognized as one of the pillars uh, in, under the blueprint under AEC. A very important question would be what happens to the small and medium entrepreneurs in the value chain? You know, this, there's so much sca uh, high scale production uh, that happens at the processing level and there's so much economies of scale in marketing and processing and distribution. But what about the small and medium enterprises? Can they comply? And I uh, had pointed out that uh, resources, resources are becoming scarce. Every sector is asking for more resources, be it agriculture, be it water, be it non-agriculture. So there is increasing resource scarcity and increasing price volatility. What are the implications for that? Thank you very much.